Hello viewers, my name is Mrs. Z. Koloka from Ebenezer Majombozi High School, a life science educator. Welcome to the ECDO broadcast studio. Today's lesson is about the paper that we are going to write next week on the 3rd of June. Uh, I will be doing an overview of the paper. Welcome to our second part of the lesson. Remember, we are still continuing with an overview of paper one that we'll be writing on life sciences on the 3rd of June. With the topics that we have already mentioned, we were still busy with genetics on our previous slide. We were about to talk about the mistakes that we do on genetic inheritance, more especially on the pedigree diagram. One of the things that we normally confuse as learners, the minute we see a pedigree diagram with those keywords saying that this is a male, a square referring to a male, a circle referring to a female, we normally think that all pedigree diagrams are sex-linked inheritance. And yet, it is not always the case. You always look at the opening statement if the opening statement is not telling you that it is a sex-linked inheritance, please don't, ma don't make it a sex-linked inheritance. Unless it is said to be hemophilia or color blindness, which are the two ones that we're supposed to learn as per our exam guideline. Let's look, for example, at this question that I have in front of me here. Muscular dystrophy is a genetic condition that causes muscles to weaken over time. It is caused by a recessive allele on an X chromosome. Highlight X chromosome. Once it said X chromosome, it means now it is a sex-linked disorder or sex-linked inheritance. You are already given an allele that you should use there, which is an XD there. Then the dominant allele is X capital letter D results in normal muscle formation. So it is important to read the opening statement once you miss it on the opening statement, you will end up not getting the answers right on your question. It's one of the questions that is supposed to be answered easily by, by learners, but they often mistake it with sex-linked inheritance, even if it does not lead to that. But this example that we have here now is an example of a sex-linked inheritance. And remember, whenever you represent your alleles on sex-linked inheritance, you use your sex chromosomes. And your sex chromosomes is X and X in females, X and Y in males. If we can just take a few questions from here, it says there, how many offsprings do individual 1 and 2 have? You look at individual 1 and 2. Individual 1 and 2 has got offspring number 3, number 4, number 5. Number 6 does not belong there. Number 6 is married to number 5. So therefore you must be very careful. The offsprings are the ones that are directly linked to the parents that are on, um, above them. So you must be very careful when it comes to that. Could I explain why more males than females are more likely to have muscular dystrophy? If you are looking at this diagram, you will find out that oh, out of about five or six males, three of them are affected. All the females are not affected. Then the question is asking, why are males more affected than females? Remember, this is a sex-linked inheritance. And all sex-linked inheritance are inherited on an X chromosome. And males only have one X chromosome. And they do not have the second X to counter the effect of the recessive allele. So if it is caused by a recessive allele and the hormone, sorry, and the males receive the recessive allele from one of the parents, more specifically from the mother, because when a male is formed, a male will get a Y chromosome from the father and an X chromosome from the mother. If he receives a recessive allele from the mother, then that male will end up having that particular disorder. We must also be very careful, even though they say that this sex-linked inheritance is caused by a recessive allele. Sometimes examiners will say it is caused by a dominant allele. 
They want to check whether you understand a difference between a dominant allele and a recessive allele. So we must be very careful. The opening statements are not just there to decorate your question. They are there to lead you so that you are able to answer the questions that are related to that. So be careful. Even if you are asked to do a genetic cross like question 2.2.4, make sure that the alleles that you'll be using are the alleles that are showing that this is a sex-linked inheritance. You don't use the autosomal ones. If it's an autosomal um, uh, question, then use the alleles that do not involve sex chromosomes. I hope that is clear, learners. Please make sure that you read your opening statements very well. Highlight them where possible. Once it says sex-linked, highlight. Once it introduces a sex-linked allele, highlight it. And then you'll know that when I ask, answer my, 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 when I give my answers, my answers are supposed to have alleles that have got sex chromosomes in them. Then still on genetics, genetic engineering, learners, we also uh, struggle to differentiate between genetic engineering as well as cloning. We must make sure that we are able to describe those processes and the difference that is there in them. Make sure that we are able to describe the process, how it occurs. If you are given a context of genetic engineering on the production of insulin, you must be able to describe that process. Sometimes diagrams will be given in an exam. Be able to know that a particular gene has been manipulated. A particular gene has been changed, has been modified in order to get the gene that you require as a scientist. But when it comes to cloning, the whole organism is cloned. You need all the genes of that particular organism. You need the entire organism. So you need an identical copy of that particular organism. You are not focusing on a particular gene. You need the entire organism. But once you focus on a particular gene, it means now you are modifying a gene, and therefore that is genetic engineering. You must be able to explain that process. Let's look, for example, at this question that we have here. It says here, read the passage below. Genetically modified maize, the bacterium bacillus thuringiensis uh, produces a toxin called Bt that kills insects. This bacterium is used to genetically modify maize to, uh, to contain the Bt toxin. This Bt maize is toxic to insects. The first question says, describe how Bt maize is genetically modified to be insect resistant. It means a gene has been extracted from this bit maze, and then a gene has been inserted into it. What type of gene has been inserted here? A gene that is able to, uh, to be toxic to insects, so that when the insect come and feed on this maze, they get that toxin. So the genes of this maze have been genetically modified, they have been changed so that they can produce the maize plants that are, not, that are not affected by these particular insects. So we must be able to describe it, that is very much important. Also, on the topic on human response to the environment, as much as we are very good in identifying the types of neurons, we must also be able to give a reason why we have identified that particular neuron. For example, the neuron that is in front of me, a question might say, the first question, for example, in this one, identify the type of neuron shown in the diagram. Easily, learners will say that it's a motor neuron. Then the second question says, give one visible reason. You see, what I said on the beginning, visible reason. What is it that is visible that you see that makes you say that this is a, a motor neuron? This neuron is multipolar. In other words, there are so many extensions that are arising from this particular neuron. So therefore, this type of a neuron is a multipolar neuron. So you must be able to identify, this is what you see. This neuron is multipolar, and therefore that's why I'm saying that this neuron is a motor neuron. Then also, on the eye function as well, functioning as well as defects. As much as we will be able as learners to label the parts of the eye and probably be able to know the functions of each part and probably be able to know how we see. We also need to know how 
uh, what will happen if a particular defect occurs in a particular region of an eye. For example, if a question says, if the part um, that is your, your optic nerve is uh, damaged, what, how will that affect your vision? You understand that the function of the optic nerve, it is to transmit impulses from your eye to your cerebrum so that your, or your senses are interpreted there. So if the, the optic nerve is, is affected, is damaged, then it means the impulses will not be transmitted. So it is important that as much as you know the function of the part, you must also be able to know if that particular part is affected, how will that affect your vision? For example, if you look at this uh, example that we have here in front of me, it says, a man is long-sighted. Then the question says, explain how the structure of the eyeball affects his vision when he reads a book without glasses. Is reading a book without glasses, in other words, is not having assistance in order to be able to read that. First of all, we need to understand why, what happens when a person is long-sighted. The eyeball is too rounded. And because the eyeball is too rounded, then the image cannot be focused on the retina. The image is focused in front of the retina, which causes now that image to be blurred. So the learner needs to explain that because the eyeball is rounded, then therefore the image is unable to focus on the retina. Why is it important that the image should focus on the retina? Remember, on the retina, it's where your photoreceptors are situated so that the stimulus can be changed into an impulse. If there is no stimulus that has been uh, changed into an impulse, then your sight will not be um, uh, registered in your mind. So if it has not touched that retina, then therefore the stimulus will not be changed into an impulse. But the question in this case is referring to the structure of the eyeball, which causes uh, or which affects the vision of a person when he is reading a book without glasses. So that structure, because it is too rounded, it is causing now that image uh, to fall, not in front of the retina, sorry, to fall behind the retina, not in front, I made a mistake, to fall behind the retina. Behind the retina, there are no photoreceptors in that particular area. And then the second question that is coming to that is saying, wearing glasses with convex lenses, um, explain how, sorry, wearing glasses with convex lenses will improve his vision when reading his books. In the first part, he was not unable to read the book because he was not wearing glasses. At the same time, the eyeball was affecting the person. And then the person now is wearing the glasses. Also, another thing that we must take note here, it is not only the eyeball that is affected here. The lens is also affected. It means the lens cannot be less convex. Hence, this person now is unable to focus the image on the retina. So therefore, by wearing now the convex lenses, that is, it will help now for this person, for the light rays to be more refracted so that the image can be able to focus on the retina. Because it is important that the image focus on the retina, not behind the retina or in front of the retina. Because behind the retina, there are no photoreceptors. In front of the retina, there are no photoreceptors. The image for a person to be able to see must land on the retina. On the retina, it is where the photoreceptors are situated. Then also, same applies with the ear as well as functioning of the ear as well as the defects. We might be good at uh, explaining how we hear or the, able to uh, label the structure of the ear and the functions of each structure, but it is also important to link the defects of the ear with the functions of the ear. Also, whilst we are describing how we hear, it is important to emphasize certain terms that are used in a particular area of your ear. For example, if you are talking about hearing, the pinna will collect sound waves and direct them to your auditory canal. That is the part of your ear, which is your outer region. You talk about sound waves. But the minute those sound waves hit your eardrum, 
it causes that eardrum to do what? To vibrate. So now you don't talk about sound waves, you talk about vibrations. Because the minute those sound waves are converted into vibrations, then the vibrations from the eardrum will be transmitted to your ossicles. So in the middle ear, you talk about vibrations. You don't, you don't talk about sound waves. Then once those sound waves are transmitted from the ossicles, then they will tra be transmitted through your oval window to your inner ear. Once they get into your inner ear, then they will set up pressure waves in your cochlea. So now in the cochlea, in other words, in your inner ear, you don't talk about vibrations, you talk about pressure waves. Hence I say that whatever you say is important. On the outer part, you talk about sound waves. In the middle part, you talk about vibrations. In the inner part, you talk about pressure waves. And then those pressure waves will stimulate the receptors in the cochlea. What are the receptors that are in your cochlea? It is the receptors of sound, the receptors that we refer to them as the organs of cotton. What will they do? They will change the stimulus into an impulse. And then the impulse will leave your ear through the nerve that we refer to it as the auditory nerve. Where it is taken, it is taken into your cerebrum. To do what? To, re to, to, to do what? For interpretation. So it is important that as we explain, once then the, the, the impulse leaves your ear, then we talk about impulse there. You don't talk about sound waves. Learners have got a tendency of talking, including sound waves right through in their description. Once you do that, you will lose marks unnecessarily. Please make sure that you focus on the outer part, sound waves. Middle part, vibrations. Inner part, um, pressure waves. Pressure waves will stimulate the organs of cotton and the organs of cotton will, will change the stimulus into an impulse. And then the impulse will be taken out of your ear through your auditory nerve. Where is it taking it? To the cerebrum for interpretation. Remember, you are linking the cerebrum to your sense organs because the function of the cerebrum, it is to receive and interpret all sensation. So your hearing is your sensation. If you still remember, even with the eye, that optic nerve will take that impulse to your cerebrum for interpretation. For you to say that you see me, that image must be interpreted. For you to say that you hear me, that sound must be interpreted. So it is very much important learners. Also, as I have said, you connect the functions with the parts of your ear. If your cochlea is affected, how will that affect your hearing loss? You know that in the cochlea are your organs of cotton. If the organs of cotton are there and the cochlea is affected, then it means the stimulus will not be changed into an impulse. And therefore, you'll have hearing loss. So it is important, learners, that we make sure that we understand this. And I hope that as you prepare for your lesson, you will focus on these areas. I might not have covered everything, but these are the main points or main areas we find that you make mistakes on. Please make sure that you consult your exam guideline. Your exam guideline has got descriptions of all those descriptions that are needed for six marks, like your, your, your transcription, your translation, your oogenesis, your spermatogenesis. Take it as it is from your exam guideline. Don't come up with your own things that will end up confuse the concepts there. Take it as it is. That exam guideline is to uh, guide you in order to answer the question as it is expected in your exams. Make sure that you relax, you don't come late into your exams, bring all your tools and make sure that you are ready for this exam. Life science is one of the nice subjects because it is a subject that we can interact it, a subject that talks about things that we deal, them, we deal with them on a daily basis. All the best of luck on your exam. I hope that you will nail this coming exam. I thank you. We have come to the end of our lesson. You can leave your questions and comments. Don't forget to leave your name of the school so that you can give shout outs. Please share and recommend and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. See you in the next lesson.